morning and welcome. Blessed and happy Easter to you today. A few announcements. Uh, first of all, Tuesday at 6.45 at the church here, we'll have our ladies' Bible study. And if you have any questions concerning that, just ask Stephanie after the service. And Wednesday, we'll be uh, having another Dispatches from the Front uh, lesson and uh, have prayer, time of prayer afterwards. Saturday at 8 o'clock, we'll have our monthly men's breakfast at Denny's and Dale. And then in two weeks from today, after the morning service, or the evening service, rather, of the 18th, we'll have our quarterly business meeting. But today, being Easter, we want to focus on some hymns that speak of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. So the first, if you would open to hymn number 116, please. O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Hymn number 116. This is a, a very solemn song, very solemn hymn, as we see the suffering of Jesus here. And uh, for instance, verse 1, as uh, you see, O sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thy only crown. How art thou pale with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn? How dost thou visage languish, which once was bright as morn? So we stand and sing this. Sing it uh, thoughtfully, meditatively, the, the words, just the weight of the, of the words, how our Lord suffered. And uh, verse 2, the reason why he suffered as well. So let us stand and sing this on page 116. week is the, the Kirby family in South Africa. Uh, most of you know them. They're running the orphanage down there. And Joel sent me a uh, short video clip that we're going to show you at this time. Representing the Kirby family here in Johannesburg, South Africa, at Home 
We just wanted to take a minute to say thank you so much for your support for us over the last few years. It means a lot. It means a lot when people come alongside and partner us and help us to be able to do what we do here. What we do here, if you don't know, is we take in at-risk and abandoned children uh, and care for them on site here at Hope to See uh, This year was crazy, probably was crazy for you too, but even in this last crazy year, we were able to build the house that you see behind us. Uh, started just as lockdown began last year and finished it in December and now have people uh, living in this home. So we're excited that God was working even during this time. Uh, another ministry that was able to happen during this last year is called Pontitila Soweto. Uh, if you Google Maps, Soweto is one of the largest townships in the world. It must have been doubled in their investment too. Uh, it's very famous. having those video clips because for me if I don't see them a lot of times it's you know out of sight out of mind and it's very easy to do that so keep praying for the Kirby's uh be praying for them especially right now uh, his mother is uh, in the hospital they've got her uh, what do you call it or she's unconscious they've made her unconscious so um there's cancer there's COVID there's just several things that are going on and it's it's uh it's touch and go right now so be praying for you know, the Kirby's is there dealing with that. Her, her name is Pat Kirby. Well, all right. It's a great morning to <clears throat> rejoice and and praise the Lord, and we're going to do that now as we pray. So let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this great truth of Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection. And we thank you for what Christ has done. We thank you that while we deserve to be beaten, and while we deserve to be scourged, and while we deserve to have thorns pierced into our heads, and while we deserve to die, and while we deserve to die eternally, you died, you paid the penalty for our sin that we might rise again. We might not be under the penalty of sin. We might not be under the power of sin. And that we might be resurrected like you as our union with Christ <clears throat> to live by the power of your spirit <clears throat> to bring you glory. And so we thank you for this great truth of the resurrection. You did this to bring yourself glory and that we get the benefit. And so we pray that you would help us to rejoice in this great truth and that we would walk in it, that you would help us to <clears throat> reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto you through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we thank you and praise you. We thank you for this day that we focus on your resurrection, and yet we realize that your resurrection power is available to us every day. And we thank you for making that true. And I pray for us that you would help us to, to understand that even more. We would understand how you've overcome sin, You've overcome death. You've overcome the grave. And while we fear death in the grave, we don't always fear sin like we should. And yet you give us the power to overcome it daily. We thank you for that resurrection power that's available through your son, Jesus Christ, through his spirit. So we thank you for that. And we pray for 
us as a church, that you would help us to draw near to you, that you bless us for your glory, that you would help us in making disciples of each other, and that this church would be a lighthouse and a strong house for your work. So we ask your help here. We also pray, as we just heard for the Kirby's, as they work there in South Africa, we pray that you'd give them your power, that they would recognize it daily as they work in a hard place, doing a hard job. They need overcoming power just like we do. So we pray you'd bless them with it. And we pray you're, you'd just really bless all their efforts there. We pray also for Joel's mom who's sick. Her name's Pat. We pray for her, that you'd help her, give her your comfort as only you can. We also pray for Tom and Annie Reed as they approach this surgery this week. We pray that you would bless them, pray you give them comfort and peace. So we ask your special blessing on them. We also pray for Mary Sue. She's not able to be here today. We pray you'd help her, encourage her, and Dan, Jason, and the whole family. We just pray your blessing on them. Grant them your strength and your peace and your comfort. And so we thank you for this privilege today, and we pray now as we move forward in this service that you would speak and we would hear, and that you'd bring great glory to yourself here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Our next hymn, 135. 135, please, in contrast to the previous one, this is one of joy and triumph, of gladness and victory, the day of resurrection. And of course, this is why we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, because it was on Sunday that Jesus rose from the grave, and more particularly, Easter Sunday. And this is why we uh, celebrate and commemorate this day. The world has its own uh, agenda, but uh, we know the truth, and this is why there is an Easter. This is uh, the reason. Uh, the day of resurrection, Jesus rose from the dead, and as verse 1 says, this is a message that is to be heralded, is to, is to tell, to be told all around, all abroad, to throw the whole earth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Let us remain seated as we sing this, please. <laughs> Please turn your Bibles to Luke 24. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Luke 24, 1 through 12. And if you're able to, please stand for the reading of God's word. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, 
bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down from their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in, into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third, bit, third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. There was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Thank you. And our final hymn, 132, He Lives. And this is the glorious assurance that we have. Uh, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. Uh, a dead Savior can't save you he couldn't save himself dead savior can't help you he uh, couldn't even help himself but jesus is a, a living savior he has risen from the grave he has conquered death and he is with us so we have this wonderful confidence that the various religions of the world do not have their saviors are are dead muhammad is dead in the grave buddha dead in the grave but jesus lives uh, and uh, the, those who trust in him he lives in, in your hearts and uh, we uh, sing this joyfully and triumphantly uh, our living savior let's sing all three verses please i serve a risen savior he's in the world today i know that he is living whatever men may say i see his hand of mercy i hear his voice of cheer just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation's only one. You ask me how I know it is.
Good morning. Judy, it's good to see you out again. This has been the first time they've let you out for how long now? Since it started. It's good to have you out. We thank you for Lisa for taking care of her. Appreciate it. Lisa Tillman and uh, what you meant for us, and we appreciate that very much for doing some caregiving there. And you guys have been sharing your statistics. I'm glad you could be with us. Trust the service will be a blessing for you today. Okay. Let's go ahead and be, you, you might as well go ahead and turn in all four of your gospels. We're going to be flipping around all four places. We'll start in Matthew 28. Uh, children, I forgot, you can be dismissed for children's church. We know today marks the, the most important event that has ever happened in the history of mankind. And it's because of this day that we can, we can say with confidence, he is what? He's risen. Our Lord is risen. We don't serve a dead Savior. I had this uh, conversation with, with a, a young man yesterday, and was uh, we were talking about you know, what, what's the difference of all the religions and why so many different ones. And, and really what it comes down to is you know, one of the first things is who is Jesus? And if they don't get that part right, they're done. I mean, it's who is Jesus? And after that, it's all these ones who say who Jesus is, that he is the risen son of God. Once people understand who he is, the next question is, what do you need to do with him? How do we, how do we make peace with God when we know what Jesus has done? Is it based on what we can do? Or is it based on what he's done? And it really is, is the dividing line of every religion. And there's not many that will hold to the, the simple truth that it's based on what Jesus did on that cross, that you and I can have a relationship. And I'm thankful that we can have this day where we can experience and enjoy through the scriptures what Jesus did for us. And it's good for us to remember what happened. It's good for us to remember that he rose from the dead. But we do need to remember, too, as we, and some of this is going to be overlapped from this morning, but it's good to remember that during this, at this point in time, that 2,000 years ago, there was confusion. It was not just as clear cut. Everybody got it. There was, there was pain. There was confusion. And I was sharing earlier how last night as I was, as I was going to sleep, I, I laid down around 10, 1030, and I was thinking, you know, 2,000 years ago, those people who were going to sleep were heartbroken. They, they weren't anticipating getting up and, and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. They were going to sleep defeated. They were having a really hard time. And even after they, they understood that Jesus was risen, they were troubled. They didn't get it all. So they've gone through. We just think of the things they've seen. They saw his betrayal. The, the, the apostles who, who saw one of their own betray Jesus, they're hurt. They saw the arrest. They saw the false trials. They saw the abuse. And then the, it just all led up to seeing his crucifixion. But if that's where the story stopped, we're in big trouble. Thankfully, he didn't stay dead. Our Lord rose from the dead. And because of that, we have 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. There's nothing we, we need to go home if the resurrection didn't happen. See, this, this teaching is the backbone of Christianity. The resurrection, as I mentioned a minute ago to this fellow yesterday, it is the key difference between Christianity and every false religion in the world. Every religion that's out there, they can take you to their founder's tomb, to his grave. They can show you this is where our founder, this is where our key guy, this is where he's buried. Christianity can't do that. We can't take you to the tomb of Jesus for sure. We, can, and we can't see where his body is because he's the only one who conquered death. 
And I realized we had an early service and we highlighted this, this, this idea of the Lord's resurrection. But I, I want us to put off our study in Acts and I want us to just take another hour and look at this, this key event that has happened for us, that he did out of love for us. And I trust we'd be able to get some, some very good practical applications from this as well. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll start looking at the various texts. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing Jesus to, to pay our price. Thank you for taking our sin on yourself. Lord, I, I pray that you would cause us to be grateful, cause us to remember what you've done. Lord, open our eyes to the truths that you desire for us to see today. Lord, I pray for each one in this room that you would use your word to encourage, to strengthen, or whatever the individual need is, I ask that you would meet it through this time that we have in your word. I ask for your help as I preach, that you would keep my words free from error. God, help me not to be a distraction to the message that you desire to have preached. And Lord, I ask most of all that you would in some way glorify yourself through our time here together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 28, we'll be looking at this, in this first section, at these first four verses. And leading up to this section, leading up to these verses, Matthew 27 and before, leading up to these, we saw where the two Marys had seen uh, Joseph and Nicodemus. We saw them, they brought the body of Jesus to the tomb. These ladies saw, him, saw those guys put the, uh, the spices on the body. They knew where he was. They knew what these men had done. So they're familiar with where he is. So this morning in the text we're going to be looking at, this morning what these ladies are doing is they get up early and they are coming to worship Jesus. And I want us to, to notice some things about this. First of all, uh, your first point, the devotion of the women. Let's look at verse one. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So we see here that the two Marys, now we know also from, from uh, Luke's account that there was Salome, there was Joanna, there were some other women. It wasn't just these two. These are, Mary Magdalene is like the key, the key figure in this, but there were multiple people, ladies who came to see the tomb of Jesus. And they, they, all four accounts use a similar word, but they use this phrase, they came, before, here we just read, it began to dawn. Mark says it was the rising of the sun. Luke says it was very early. John says it was still dark. The, the phrase literally is in deep dawn. So what they, that they did is these ladies got up while it was still dark and they started making their way towards the tomb. And this is nothing unusual. We do the same thing, uh, forgive my example, but we go hunting. We get up while it's dark. We'll be in the tree stand when the sun's coming up so we can be ready. These ladies wanted to be up and there as daybreak was hitting. They were anxious to come and to see where Jesus was. That's the point here. These ladies are anxious. They are wanting to show their love. They're wanting to show their devotion to Jesus by bringing these expensive spices to anoint him. This is a special thing for them. And obviously, if you've got a group of ladies bringing spices at the same time, they planned this. These ladies are showing that they had a devotion to Jesus. Now, keep this in mind. In their minds, Jesus is dead. He's not risen yet. So these ladies, even though they are, I would say they're experiencing defeat, even though Jesus, in their minds, is still dead, they're showing allegiance. They still love him. They're still being faithful to him. And I hope that this is a challenge to us this morning. Even when you and I do not understand 
the whys and the wherefores. Why am I having to go through this hard time? Why are these difficulties here? Why am I sick? Why am I, what, what, whatever the case may be. Even when you and I are going through hard times, we can learn from these ladies. They didn't lose their devotion to Jesus when in their mindset, everything was lost. They stayed faithful. You and I, we, we have no excuse. We have a Lord who has risen for us, who has paid the price of our sin. How can, how, how can we not serve him when difficulties come? He deserves this. Some people have asked, why, why these ladies? Why did they get to be the first ones to, to, to find out about Jesus? And I don't know, but I can tell you this. Maybe it was because they were there. And that may sound kind of simplistic, and I, my mind does that a lot, but these ladies were being faithful. These ladies, all they were doing, they were simply showing their love and their devotion to Jesus. And because they were where they were, where they should have been, they got the blessings that go along with it. They just simply wanted to be where they should be. And can I just, again, suggest for us, kind of like um, Abraham's servant said, I being in the way, Lord, let me. Let's just be where, where, where we are supposed to be. Let's do the small things we know we're supposed to do. And let's be on the front lines, if you will, so that we can be in the way when these blessings happen. Can I, I'll suggest this to you. It's worth it. Us being faithful is worth it. And we need to be. Jesus deserves this. Okay, let's look at the second thing, the descent of the angel. Verse number two. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So this earthquake happened, it says, for the angel of the Lord. Because this angel of the Lord, because he came down, the earthquake happened. I don't understand what that correlation was, but because the angel came down, the earthquake occurred. Now, why did he come down? He came down to roll back this stone. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all say he rolled it back. John says it was taken away. Literally, it was removed out of its place. The only thing I can figure is maybe he rolled that thing back hard, and it, it moved. It got out of its track and off of that little trough that it sets in to block in the, the hole, the entrance to the cave. But this stone was totally out of the way. And, and keep this in mind, the angel didn't roll that stone back so that Jesus could get out. He rolled the stone back so people could get in. Jesus was gone. Jesus was already out of this tomb. The stone let them in. So third thing we see is the description of the angel, verses three and four. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So it sounds like a little bit like the angels at Jesus' birth. Remember the people when they saw those angels, they were terrified. They were scared. Well, it scared these guys too. People are scared. There, here's a couple of bright, shining men. They're obviously, I'll use the word angelic. I don't know what other word to use, but these are bright and shining creatures. And it caused the guards to shake from fear and it caused them to faint. So that's what these two verses are telling us. So sometime, sometime, this is an overview here, between sunset on Saturday night and between sunrise on Sunday morning, somewhere in that time frame, Jesus rose from the dead. He left the tomb. Then the angel has come down. Before the women get there, he moves the stone, and he announces to them what's going to happen or what has happened. And these guards, they've passed out from fear. They're done. Now, can you imagine and just have this thought in your head. Imagine the excitement the angel must have had. We're told that angels look down on the children of men to see that, you know, they want to see this glory of what God has done and how salvation is working with them. Can you imagine being the one angel that gets to share this news? Jesus is risen. He got to share it. You and I have that same privilege. Just like that angel could share that news, we share that news. We're to herald that news. So that's the picture we have up to this point. So let's turn now to Mark's account, Mark 16. Keep your finger, we'll probably be back in Matthew. So go to Mark 16. 
The angel's done his deed. He's done what he came to do, and he's waiting on the ladies to show up so he can let them know what's happened. So we're going to start with verses two and three here. We see the dilemma of the ladies. Verse number two. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, who shall roll us, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? So it's early morning. The sun's just barely starting to poke up. They're getting really close, and they're talking to each other. This is normal. They're talking to each other, and their concern is, how are we going to get this stone out of the way so we can get in and anoint his body with these spices? They don't know at this point. They don't know about the guard being posted. That happened after. And at least two of them know about Joseph and Nicodemus doing that initial burial anointing but their problem is a real one how do we a group of ladies roll this huge stone out of the way and if they're like ladies some ladies i know they're going to figure out a way to make it happen but they they have a concern they got a dilemma on their hands and then we see their discovery the discovery of the ladies in verse four and when they looked they saw that the stone was rolled away it's already done for it was very great and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. They were scared. So they arrived, and the stone is moved. Now, from our perspective, we hear this happening, and our thought is, this is awesome. The stone's moved. He's resurrected. Everything is great. But from their perspective, and I'll just tell you what's happened. They think grave robbers came. Somebody's come and they've taken the body of Jesus and they're scared of that. That's a common problem. In that day and time, that was a very common problem. And John's account, you don't need to turn there yet, but John chapter 20 that we looked at earlier, John 20 and verse 1 indicates to us that when, as these ladies were approaching the tomb, Mary Magdalene saw the stone rolled away and she turned and she left to go get Peter. She's not with this group, it looks like, that went into the tomb. So she left to go report to John and Peter, who was there, but she went to report that brave robbers had taken the body of Jesus. And the rest of them stayed, and we see this account that we have in front of us. And they were greeted by one of the two angels that was in that tomb. Look at, look at uh, Melissa, let's turn over for this one to the rest of this, Luke 4. I mean, Luke, 20, Luke 23. 24, verse 4, excuse me. Luke 24 and verse 4. You see the distress of the ladies. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, they bowed down their faces to the earth and said to them, Why seek you the living among the dead? Jesus is alive. These ladies, they're scared out of their wits. That's what's happening. That's the phrasing we have here. They are scared. Running's not going to help. You've got these guys who are shining, who are supernatural beings. Running's not going to help. And so all they can do is not look at them. You ever seen the little kids? And if you don't, if I don't see you, you can't see me. Maybe they had their heads buried. They were down. They were scared. And I don't blame them for being scared. These are angelic beings and think about what had just happened you have the strong guys you have the armed guards what did they do they fainted at least these ladies held it together they were better off than those guards were but this is something that should have scared them but then it gets better it gets better let's go to this third point the resurrection is announced the resurrection is announced i'm trying to go through this uh Earlier things, a little bit quicker and get to the resurrection part. So let's look at back in Mark's account. Mark 16 and verse 6. I'm glad these ladies didn't faint. They would have missed the biggest news of all eternity if they had fainted. Have you ever been in a position where you were kind of too busy doing something else and you missed a big announcement? Remember... Short story time. Uh, when my mom was proposed to by her uh, 
after my dad had died, the, the man that just passed away, when he proposed to her, we, he took us all out to eat, my, me and my brothers, her, and he said, uh, I've, got a, I've got a question I want to ask. And about that same time, the waiter came and started asking me questions. And I turned and asked to answer him. And all of a sudden, it had already been popped. The question was done. I missed it. I was too distracted. You know, these ladies, I'm thankful. They didn't get that distraction. Without this happening, they would have been, they, they, there would have been no hope. Without this happening, we have no hope. Let's, let's look at this first point. Death didn't win. Death didn't win. Mark, uh, Mark's account, verse 6. He said unto them, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Look where they laid him. He's risen. He's not here anymore. He conquered death. No one conquers death except for God. And God come in the flesh, Jesus Christ, he conquered death. He is not here. He is risen. And again, we have this word at the very end of that verse, behold, the place where they laid him. That word behold, if you remember, this is that one of pay attention to this one. This is big news. Take special note of this. Look where his body was. Look what, where it had been. It is now gone. He is showing them here is the proof. We don't serve a dead Savior. Our Lord is living. We don't even need to look. We can remember what he did on that cross. We can remember the pain he went through. But our Lord is a risen Lord. And that's where our focus needs to stay is the fact that he is no longer on that cross. He is no longer in that grave. He is risen and he is living. And again, this is the key fact that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. This is it. And you and I need to keep this in the forefront of our mind. Jesus showed his miraculous power by conquering death. This is like the keystone of all the miracles that he did. And he conquered it himself. Jesus conquered. And because he did that, you and I can be confident that he's going to raise us too. If we know him as Savior, he will raise us. Second Corinthians, you don't need to turn to these. We'll read them. I'll just read them for you. Second Corinthians 4, 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. First Corinthians 6, 14, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Romans 8, verse 11, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, so if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you're saved. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. See, this, this fact of what Jesus did, of the power he showed, this is the only reason that you and I can have this confidence of one day being able to see the Lord because he has risen. But let me, let me say this. It wasn't enough in a sense. It wasn't enough for these ladies just to know this truth. It wasn't enough. Let's look at the second point. They dispersed the truth. Again, uh, Mark's account, verse 7 but go your way, this is the angel talking, go your way, tell the disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. They were to go and tell the disciples. And he singles out, I like that he singles out Peter. Peter had that failure. Peter, he blew it. He denied the Lord. And Jesus is making sure, you know, you make sure Peter knows he's in this thing still. Peter hasn't, he's not gone too far from me. He can be forgiven for what he's done. And th th this verse, this verse to a point, it's like the second proof, part, the second part of the proof of the resurrection. If all they have, when they, if all they had was an empty tomb, it could have been grave robbery. If all they had was an empty tomb, you know, anything could have happened. The, the Romans could have done something. The Jews, Jewish leaders could have done something. 
But he states in the end of that verse that Jesus is going to appear to them. Jesus is going to come, and they're going to get to see him a little bit later. There's the second part of the proof they were going to get. It wasn't just an empty tomb. It was a living Jesus. And Jesus is going to show himself very powerfully to these ladies, to the apostles. They were going to get to see him. And I do like the pattern that we see with these ladies. The angel said, come and see, right? And then the next command he gives is, go and tell. That is exactly what you and I are supposed to be doing. We are to come and see. We, are need, we need to get to know Jesus. We need to enter a relationship with Jesus. And I, I was sharing with the fellow I was with yesterday. I, you know, it's not, we don't need to come and, and, and get to know a religion. We need to come and get to know a person. That person is Jesus. If you are depending this morning on being Baptist in order to get you to heaven, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to go to hell. Baptist won't do it for you. I don't care what religion it is. It won't do it for you. You need Jesus. Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. So these people, they, they got introduced to a living Savior. And when we get introduced to our living Savior and we come to know him personally, then the mandate is there. Go and tell. And he, they were to go, in this case, go tell the apostles. Go let them see what has happened. You and I Matthew 28, are to go and proclaim Jesus. We're to go and make disciples. That is our mandate. That's what these ladies were supposed to do. Third thing we see in this point, they displayed obedience. They displayed obedience. And let's just look at verse 8. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchers. They trembled, they were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. These ladies took off running. These ladies did what they were told, and we're told their emotions here. They were fearful. They should have been fearful. They were amazed. They should have been amazed. Now, we don't have it in Mark's account, but back in Matthew's, in Matthew chapter 28, we're told that they had great joy. So, yes, they were fearful. Yes, they were amazed, but they had greatest joy that could ever come to any people on the face of this planet. These ladies were in gloom. These ladies were totally hopeless, and now they find out our Lord isn't here anymore. Our Lord is risen. These ladies, and to use our phrase today, they were pumped. They were excited about what God had done. Here's the question I've got for you. How could they keep that news to themselves? How can they dare hold that? How can they keep it in when you're so excited about something? You're going to tell somebody, whoever you can find, your good news. That's exactly what these ladies did. They had a direct command. How could they disobey it? These ladies were excited. You and I serve a living Lord who has given us everything. He's given us, we were spiritually dead, and he's made us spiritually alive. That's the only reason we can have any type of confidence at all. He's done this for us. How can we not obey him? Romans 12, it's a reasonable thing that we follow him. It's reasonable. Our Lord gave himself as a living sacrifice. He gave himself as a dying sacrifice. It is a living sacrifice. How can we not be a living sacrifice for him? That's what our commission is. Now, at this point in our account, everybody, in my opinion, everybody knew the tomb is empty. The people know. Think about this. If it was not empty, would the soldiers have still been there guarding it? Tomb's empty. They're passed out. They know that tomb is empty or they'd be staying there. They're, they're going to be gone. They're going to have to tell their leaders, he's gone. The body's gone. The Jews, the Jewish leaders, they know that tomb's empty. If it was not empty, they wouldn't have been making up lies to try to conceal the fact that it's empty. The ladies know that tomb is empty. If that tomb was not empty, they'd have been busy anointing his body, putting the spices in there. They're not. These ladies took off running to the disciples. Peter and John, 
They know that that tomb is empty. They went and saw it firsthand. See, there, there, there's no other explanation for that tomb being empty other than he is risen. That's why that tomb is empty. And, and here's the point. Only God can do that. Only God can, can raise from the dead. And since Jesus rose from the dead, we know he is God. Now, it's, it's one thing to say that, but I want you to think about that phrase for just a minute. He is God. If Jesus is God, which he is, okay? If Jesus is God, that has some meaning to it. It means, number one, we're accountable to him because he's God. He's the one that keeps us breathing. He's the one that provides. He's the one that sustains. He's the one who's making the choice. Look, when, when he says it's time for you to go, you're going. You don't have control over this. And we are accountable to him. It is a blessing that he wrote. I, I, I'm, I, I, won't, I, I hope I never pull back from that statement. It is a blessing that Jesus rose from the dead, but it also gives us responsibility. Because we know the truth, because we know what he did, we're accountable to him. To whom much is given, much shall be required. You and I are accountable for this truth that we know because he has risen from the dead and he's offered us salvation through him and him alone. We're responsible for what we do with that. With that offer, thankfully, he has the power over life and over death, and he can give us life as we trust him. Fourth one, and this is a short one, but the prophecies affirmed. The prophecies affirmed. Uh, turn over to Luke's account, Luke 24, and we'll start with verse 6. Gives the angel speaking, saying, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Now, this is a short section, but I, I just want to point out this passage like the angel pointed out. Now, this can be seen as a little bit of a chiding. These ladies and the apostles, they're not remembering what Jesus said. Jesus, Jesus made it very clear, I am going to be crucified. I am going to suffer. I am going to die. I am going to rise again on the third day. And he's telling them, you need to remember this. You need to bring this back into your mind so you can think on this. Because Jesus prophesied that this was going to happen, and he prophesied it numerous times. He prophesied it enough so that when the Jewish leaders, remember, they, they went to Pilate and they said, hey, look, this guy said he was going to rise again. This guy prophesied that he was going to beat death. I want you to set a guard. And they, the Jewish leaders remembered this. But his own followers, they are so focused on him being their reigning physical Messiah. They're focused on him ousting the Romans and them stepping into power and, and, and ruling with him. That is their entire focus that they have. And because that's been their focus, they're not remembering the negative. They're not remembering the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to die. They didn't like that part. Remember, Peter fussed at him with it. They're not remembering. But now they're reminded. Verse 8 again says they remembered his words. We would use the phrase, it clicked. They got it. Now they're starting to understand. They can put these pieces together. Doesn't this describe us a lot of times? I mean, we know the truth. We've got the word of God. We understand what it is that God desires from us, and yet sometimes we live these defeated lives. And then somebody can come alongside, like we need so often, and give us that reminder. You don't need to get you know, verbally beat up. Usually we just need that reminder. And it's that, oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, okay, it clicks, I get it. And we have that reminder we need 
to follow our Lord, to do as he expects us to do. So these prophecies are affirmed. Jesus had made the prophecies and they're being reminded. Last one, point five, the disciples are astonished. The disciples are astonished. I picture the disciples, you know, sitting in this, wherever this room was they're at, I can picture them sitting there, hanging out together, licking their wounds, feeling sorry for themselves. They, this, is, this is rough. They're mourning, and then all of a sudden, here comes Mary Magdalene. And then right on her heels is these other ladies. And you, you can just imagine the energy that entered this room. These ladies are excited. So let's look at the... the First point here, let's look in um, John's account, John 20 and verse 2. John 20 and verse 2, we see the disclosure of the facts. The disclosure of the facts. Then she ran, this is Mary Magdalene, and, and came to Simon Peter, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, there's John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid. Okay. They. We're not told who she's saying the they is. Most likely the grave robber. She's thinking, because again, this is a very prevalent problem they have back then. She leaves. She comes to them. She makes this explanation. And then we have the other ladies come in. That's in Luke's account. And they say, Peter, John. Here's what the angel said. Here's what we saw. Here's what has happened. And whether they believe her or not, it, they're doubting her for sure. They're definitely doubting her. But whether they believe her or not is not their problem, not the lady's problem. It doesn't matter for the lady's sake whether or not the apostles receive what she said. Their job was to go and tell. Their job was just to be faithful. They obeyed what they were told to do. That's as far as they can go. You and I have the same privilege. We are told to go and proclaim, go make disciples, and we can't control what anybody else believes. We can't control what they do with what we say, but you and I must be faithful. You and I are to be like these ladies. We are to be the witnesses that we're supposed to be. Faithfulness is our responsibility. And here, those disciples, they didn't believe them. We're told in Luke's account that what they said sounded like nonsense. They didn't buy it. So they chose not to believe these ladies. And here's really, you know, the thinking in their minds probably made sense. A resurrection is not possible. It's not going to happen. And they kept doubting until finally they saw the Lord. That's when their doubts fully stopped. And I'm sure that hurt the ladies. I appreciate that these ladies, they did what was right. And that's where we need to be. So look at the second thing. Again, John's account, uh, starting with verse 3, the disciples go to the tomb. Verse 3 says, Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and they came to the sepulcher, and they ran both together. And the other disciple, John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying, yet he went not in. Then came Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher, and he saw the cloths lie, and the napkin, which is about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which first came to the sepulcher. So Peter and John, their mentality, we got to see this for ourselves. They know something's happened. These ladies are excited. Something had to have happened there. So the word and the words he uses are so applicable, they ran. If you're just a little curious, you're going to walk. You'll talk about it as you go. But these people ran. They were anxious. One outran the other. They're that anxious. Now, verse 5, we see that John's first. He stayed outside. He looks in. He sees the, 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 the cause that wrapped that wrapped the body, they're all lying there. When Peter gets there, he goes in and he sees the cloth that was about his head. It was folded and it's set to the side. If this had been a grave robber, they would have either taken the body with the claws wrapped around it. They sure wouldn't have cared about folding anything or they'd have ripped all those claws off, tore them off and just taken the body. Whichever way they wanted to go, they wouldn't have left those claws lying the way they were. 
this shows that it was a rising from the dead. It, Jesus did, he showed the evidence that they needed to show that he had risen. Next thing we see is the dawning of understanding. Again, verse eight. Then went in also that other disciples came to the sepulcher first and believed John got it. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. So when John saw what had happened, he believed. He understood as it clicked with him. Jesus had risen. Now it says they didn't understand the Old Testament passages. They were not understanding how the Old Testament prophecies in full referred to Jesus' resurrection. Case in point, Psalm 1610 says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We know looking backwards, that's a clear prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus. And now they're starting to get it. Things are starting to click with them. They're understanding. Jesus is gone. Jesus has risen. So what do they do? They go home. Now we're told in Luke 12, Peter's still kind of scratching his head. He's still trying to figure out what it was that had happened. And it's going to keep coming to him. He's going to keep understanding. See, you and I, we have a benefit. We have the benefit of being able to look into the completed word of God and see the fact that he is risen. And because he is risen, it's not just that that was a nice thing that happened. Because he's risen, you and I can have a confidence and ex an expectation to rise with him. If we have received Jesus as Savior, we will rise again with him. This is the most important event that has ever happened in the history of mankind. And what we need to remember is this. It impacts every one of us. It impacts everyone on this planet. If I've received Christ as Savior, if I put my trust in him alone, then I can rise with him. I can have eternal life. And that, that life starts the moment that I put my trust in him. For those who have not put their trust in Jesus alone, for those who were either, you know, in, in a, let's just say a non-Christian type belief system, for those who are religious but not haven't received Christ, the resurrection doesn't bless. The resurrection actually curses. We're under condemnation, according to John 3, until we have been to use Jesus' phrase, born again, we must have that experience happen in our lives. And everything wraps around, revolves around this idea of Jesus rising from the dead. It's the most important event. Let's stand for a moment. If you've never become a follower of Jesus, you're currently rejecting his sacrifice. You're currently not receiving. If you haven't received him at this point, you're, you're rejecting his sacrifice and his victory for you. And you're accountable for that. You've got to give an answer for what you do with the knowledge that you have. And what you need is to put your trust in him alone. Nothing else will do. Nothing else is needed. There's nothing we can offer God that he needs. He's totally sufficient. He wants us to put our trust in him and believe what he's done and that alone. If you're not sure you've entered a relationship with Jesus, we would love to help you. I would love to be able to answer questions for you. Christian, you and I need to be like these ladies. These ladies are an awesome example. We need to follow the Lord, and we need to obey him. There should be no part of our lives that gets held back. Where there's areas that we hold back, and this is just our area, and nobody's going to touch it, we've got an idol in our lives. And we need to confess that for the sin that it is. Jesus gave, literally, his all for you and me. He gave everything. The least we can do is give back our little all for him because our Lord is more than worthy of that. If I can be a help to you, feel free to come forward, see me after the service, whichever is best for you.
trust that you'll take this few minutes and do business with God. in prayer, please.